worship on this 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Let's begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, since we cannot stand before you relying on anything we have done, help us to trust in your abiding grace and live according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The epistle is from the first chapter of Philippians. St. Paul writes these words. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in May you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or in absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear side to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here, that I still have. And then the Holy Gospel from the 20th chapter of Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is that gospel reading for today from Matthew 20, which includes these words from the Master. Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Some people talk about having a Protestant work ethic, and that approach to work and life focuses on hard work and discipline and being frugal. Work hard and you'll be paid what you deserve. Don't spend more than you make. In the workplace of the civil arena, that is most certainly true. And there are many, uh, often those in the older generations would even say that we use that we could use much more of that work ethic these days. They compare themselves and their work ethic over against the people and the work ethic of a younger generation. But God's vineyard doesn't work that way. God's vineyard, His gracious reign in Jesus, is no place for Protestant work ethics or for disciples of Jesus to compare themselves to one another. God manages his vineyard by the means of grace and mercy. And when we're confronted with God's management by mercy, we sinners still pervert it with our cursed comparing. Thankfully, that does not stop our gracious landowner, Lord, from his grandiose gift. Jesus' parables are always comparing something we know about to something in his kingdom. So let's see what he's giving us in the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Let's unpack the parable. Well, the vineyard manager is Jesus. He goes out to hire workers at different times of the day and sends them into his vineyard. The first group of workers agrees to the wage offered by the manager, and they, like us, think fairness reigns supreme. The other groups of workers are content to receive whatever pay the manager determines to be right and fair. They live by faith in the manager's goodness and promise, but maybe they also think in terms of fairness. But at the end of the day, the vineyard manager upends all expectations. He's very generous with his payroll, and he pays the same wage, a denarius, a full day's pay, to all the workers, no matter how long or hard they work. Well, the first group of workers grumbles and complains. They compare themselves to the other workers. They think they are better and more deserving of higher wages. 
and that comparing, grumbling and complaining is the way of unbelief that spurns God's gracious reign in his son. Jesus and his kingdom are not about what's fair. Instead, his reign works by the grandiose giving of his grace. We can hear the workers hired first but paid last crying out, that's not fair. After all, those who worked only one hour got paid the same day's wage that they received for working all 12 hours. And we fall in sinners just like spoiled children often make the same lament. But Jesus' kingdom does not function on the basis of fairness or equality. Jesus chooses to be generous and give away his things, his blood-bought, cross won forgiveness, life, and salvation as he pleases. Jesus, the vineyard manager, says, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? So how do we succumb to that problem of compare and complain? Well, we compare ourselves to others as the standard. Right? In their pride, the workers who were hired first looked down on those who did not measure up to their standard. And in our pride, we also often look down on people around us, at home, at work, at school, even in the church. Maybe they don't think or act or speak as we would expect. So we don't love and forgive them, but we judge and avoid them. We compare ourselves to others as the standard. And when we compare ourselves with others, we may conclude that we fall short of their high standard. That person is a better parent, a better worker, or a better student than I could ever be. Maybe that person is a better Christian than I am, or has stronger faith than I do. And we might despair that we don't measure up. And we might conclude that God loves and blesses those other for folks more than he loves and blesses us. We even compare the people of God to worldly standards instead of seeing them in the light of the gracious giving of his gospel. Maybe we compare our congregation to others. If our congregation doesn't measure up, then we despair. If our congregation seems to be better, we become proud. But when we get caught up in that comparing, then we neglect God's concerns of proclaiming and hearing his word and faithfully receiving his sacrifice. Christ's kingdom is a different, more radical way for a vineyard to operate. The way of giving and management by mercy. Just as the vineyard manager in Jesus' parable absorbed the costs of paying all the workers the same wage, our Lord Jesus has absorbed the full cost of our sins, including our sins of comparing and grumbling and complain. In his death on the cross, our Lord Jesus made himself last in order to make us by his grace first in God's vineyard kingdom. And now we enjoy his eternal day's wage of forgiveness, life, and salvation. If you insist on complaining, then our Lord's command is clear. Take what belongs to you and go. Our vineyard manager, Jesus, does not want grumbling among his workers, nor does he want his workers comparing themselves with one another. But thanks be to God, he does not give you what you deserve. He does not give you what's fair. Instead, he gives you what you do not deserve, what is not fair. He gives you forgiveness and life with him. So we cling to our Messiah of mercy, our giving God, our lavish Lord. Life is about more than a day's wage. It's about receiving divine favor in the Lord's grandiose gift. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
Lord God, you have promised to hear the prayers of your people. And so we come to you this day offering you petitions and supplications for all manner and needs of people. You have invited us to seek your face and to call upon you while you are near. Lord, grant to us such confidence in your grace and favor that we seek your wisdom, walk in your ways, and delight in your gift of salvation with thanksgiving in our hearts. We delight in dwelling in your house, O Lord. Bless your church and those who minister to us in your name. Guide them to preach faithfully the whole counsel of your word, so that we be steadfast in faith in this face of temptation, threat, and trouble. You are our light and our salvation, and in you we rest our fears. Lord, grant your aid, comfort, and strength to all who suffer in body, mind or spirit be especially with the sick for whom we pray this day including those we name in our hearts before you heal them in accordance with your will and sustain them through their afflictions until the perfect healing comes in heaven your power is greater than all and your mercy is without limit. lord look with compassion upon our world of violence and terror bless those who govern here and everywhere that they protect the weak, promote the cause of virtue, administer justice to the criminal, and act with mercy toward those in need. You have shown us generosity greater than we deserve, O Lord. Silence our complaints when we request in your mercy, and teach us to be satisfied by your grace in all that we need for this mortal life, and find contentment in God's promise of the life to come. Teach us to rejoice over every sinner who repents and for everyone who comes to you in faith. All these and whatsoever other things we need, we ask you to grant us in the name of Jesus our Lord. And to your hands, O gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You are looking at something that no one alive has ever seen before. These windows were installed in 1897, and nobody has ever seen this church that is living without them. So right now we have just the storm windows in. We have these wonderful pieces of steel, which over all of these years has kept those windows straight. So other than broken pieces, uh, discolored pieces, lead missing, the windows are in remarkable condition. This is an exciting, ex very exciting project, and I am very grateful to the family that has provided the funds for it. I think it's a fitting memorial. Well, thanks so much for joining us again for worship. We're going to continue uh, to stream our services on YouTube and Facebook, and they'll be available on Zoom. Uh, also, if you do feel comfortable joining us in person for an outside worship service for this next month or so, we'll be having worship services outside under a tent, 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. They will also be available uh, on online if you prefer to follow us that way. Blessing.